Okay, so um, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Mareike Petersen. I'm currently serving at the chair of the subcommittee outreach and communication of the biodiversity information standards TEPRI group. And I'm the moderator of uh, this webinar, along with my um, TEDRIC colleagues, which is Deborah Paul. But uh, you heard already that her connection is quite unstable today. Uh, but also Thierry, our current uh, secretary, will help out today. In our webinar today, um, the topic is um, bioschemas, marking up biodiversity websites to improve data discovery and web scale integration. So we would like to welcome our presenter, Frank Michel, from the University of Côte d'Azur and uh, the National Center for Scientific Research, as well as the National Institute for Research in Computer Science and Auto Automation, INVRIA. So Frank, please uh, share your screen. Yes, I'm doing that right now. Okay, can you see my screens? My screen? Yes, thank you. Okay, okay, perfect. So, thank you, Mark, uh, for the introduction. And, uh, uh, well, first of all, I would like uh, to thank Ted Wake for, for organizing the, this webinar. Um, basically, the, the topic of, of this webinar is something I presented already uh, back in October at the Ted Wake 2020 conference. And uh, there were quite a lot of question at that time. So it, it felt a bit frustrating not to be able to continue and interact with the people. So uh, hence the, there was this idea of, of uh, uh, trying a, a longer format to be able to get into a bit of more details. Um, okay, so maybe just for a start, I will try to um, say illustrate what we mean when we talk about uh, marking up web pages in case that's not uh, all necessarily clear for everybody so <clears throat> uh, imagine you're uh, going to uh, imdb website or any other uh, website you're fond of uh, about movies or music or whatever um, you can get uh, access to such a page like in that case i i looked up in the mood for love and i will get some some different information about the movie uh, so this this looks like just a normal web page meant for humans. I mean, but if you actually uh, uh, open the code of the web page, look at the code directly, uh, you will see that there is uh, a piece of information that is not HTML. It's coded into a script uh, tag, and uh, the type is uh, JSON-LD. And what's in there is what we call markup. So it's some information that describes what's in the web page, but it describes it in a way that makes it interpretable by machine. So unlike the web page, which is meant, meant for humans, uh, that, that piece of script is meant for machines, for applications. So what's the point of doing that? Well, uh, it's to allow consumers to develop smart applications that will exploit this, this information uh, instead of just having humans being able to read the page. Um, so now, if you if you Google uh, the, the same, well, yeah, uh, ju just just uh, some ju just to connect the dots here, uh, you see that uh, there is this information about the director of that movie, Wong Kar Wai, here, and you will find this information uh, in a different format here, uh, written in JSON LD. So you have a director uh, with a type person, a URL, a name. So those terms are something that is standard, and I will describe in a minute what what it is. Um, so if you Google in the mood for love, you will get a result page like this one. Um, the results uh, consist of different information. Usually you have a summary, but you may have additional structured things. That is, if you look at the result for AMDB, you can see that there is the title and, and summary, but also the director, the release date, language, ratings. These are not just words, random words uh, added by Google like that. So then it is presented in a, in a way that makes sense. Okay, And the reason uh, they can dis display it this way in a structured manner is because they have consumed that markup data, which is in the web page, and that allows them to better understand what's the content of, the, of that page and what is the connection between the things that are described on the page. Um, and 
market data is what fuels uh, what they call, in the case of Google, the Google knowledge graph. Well, it's not the only thing, but it's one of the things that fuel th this kind of knowledge graph that they build to have some sort of knowledge of the whole world, or at least whatever is on the web. Um, and this is this knowledge graph is what is exploited at the time they create the right part of this page, which is what they call the rich snippet. So it's some sort of identity card of a movie that will give you lots of different information. But again, this is not just text that has been pasted here randomly. It's, it's really taken from structured knowledge extracted from different sources and in particular from the markup data that is in the web pages. Um, okay, so now markup data can be added within a web page in different forms, in different ways. Uh, one of the most prominent ones today is schema.org. Um, so initially schema.org is a, a, a community project, collaborative project. It's been funded uh, by four companies initially, Bing, Google, Yahoo, and Yandex. Uh, Yandex is a Russian speaking uh, search engine. And, and the point of schema.org is to define a common vocabulary that makes it possible to markup resources on the internet. So I insist here, this is on the internet, not just the web. So we, most of the time we talk about schema.org to annotate web pages, but technically you could annotate emails or any kind of other resource that you exchange in one way or another on the internet. Um, so basically, uh, so yeah, it, it describes a vocabulary that makes that provide structured data to describe the resources and make them understand understandable to search engines. Of course, the, their primary goal is search engines, and we'll see that's not the only goal that we can foresee now. But um, uh, and what they use that for is to improve the ranking because they understand better what's in the page to improve. Uh, well, for the web designers, it is a way to improve the discoverability of their web pages because uh, the, the search engines understand better, so they rank it better and, and so on. Uh, so, which means also it's some sort of uh, race for web designer to annotate it better because, yeah, Google has uh, already announced somehow that they would decrease the, the ranking of pages that do not have any markup at all. Um, so there are different ways of uh, put different formats to, to, uh, to embed this, this markup data in the web pages. Uh, JSON LD is, is uh, maybe most, well, maybe not the most used, but most uh, say pushed for now. Uh, another one was RDFA and there are also other formats, micro formats and, and micro data. So it is uh, somehow difficult to get an exact idea of how many websites in the world do use schema.org. It isn't clear. Uh, the web page of schema.org says uh, that uh, I think they say 10 million websites do use schema.org. And I just Googled uh, that and tried to find uh, the number of websites today, and it's over a billion. So that would mean that schema.org is, is only used on 1% of the website. It's very likely a totally outdated information. Uh, so the only information I found is this uh, graphic that you can see here. So it, sh it shows the evolution of uh, uh, how websites are marked up in the last three years. Um, in green, the green line is the, num the percentage of websites that do not have any markup information. And you can see that in three years, it has decreased from 55 to something like, yeah, it must be 37%. Uh, and on the other hand, all the other formats are increasing uh, and increasing steadily. So JSON-LD is the uh, orange uh, line. Um, uh, RDFA is the purple line. So you see that all, all of these are increasing steadily. So to be honest, I don't so much like this graphic because it kind of mixes, mixes up uh, things of different nature. You have here two things, formats and vocabularies. JSON-LD, RDFA, microdata, these are formats. Uh, Open Graph, Twitter Cards, Dublin Core, these are vocabularies. And actually, you can put Dublin Core annotations using either JSON LD or RDFA. But okay, let's okay, let's forget that. But anyway, the, the, the message here is that there is a clear trend that web websites and web pages are uh, more and more uh, marked up, and people understand the, the importance of doing that. Um, 
so more specifically, what, what's in schema.org? If you get to their website, you're gonna see such a list of types. It's a hierarchy, or you could call that a thesaurus. They have uh, something like more or less uh, 800 types now, plus a lot of properties that go with the types. Um, now, initially, schema.org was meant to annotate most common things on the web. Uh, that is events and movies, uh, shops, items that are for sale, uh, cookie recipes, cooking recipes, nutrition facts, whatever. Uh, so, okay, this is uh, this is interesting. But if you want to, if we want to talk about biodiversity, that's our topic here. Well, it's not going to be of much help here. Uh, so, okay, let, let's look at what happens in in our community in the biodiversity. When when we want to share data, there are lots of different possibilities that can be used, ranging from most simple to most sophisticated one. Uh, on the very simple side, you, you find web pages, which are very maybe basic way of uh, sharing your data with the world. Uh, and on the other side, uh, if you continue, you have maybe flat files that you could put for download available somewhere. Uh, if you're a bit more of a techie, you could uh, publish a web API on top of your database. And if you're more in the uh, lean data, semantic web philosophy, you're going to create a, a knowledge graph that we, you will publish uh, with following the, uh, the lean data principles. And you go still further uh, uh, towards the most sophisticated approaches. You have these big integrative uh, initiatives like GBIF and Encyclopedia of Life and IT Bio that will gather lots of information from many different, different sources uh, and, and make it a, a co consistent and co coherent role, whole. Um, now, the most sophisticated the approach, the more effort you need uh, to, to, to deploy it. Uh, and the more sophisticated, more, the more technical skills you will need, it's going to cost you some maintenance efforts and everything. So not everybody has the manpower to, uh, and the skills to push their data to GB for just even to publish a web API on top of the database. Um, now, it occurs that web pages remain uh, maybe the most common way of publishing your data and let people know about that. Uh, even if this is pretty simple. Uh, it's pretty simple and, and precisely because most of the time, well, web pages are hardly structured data. Okay, it's, it's data for humans. So it hampers integration with other databases, other sources. So since I'm talking about uh, structured, unstructured data on web pages, and I just mentioned schema.org providing a way to structure data, you see where I'm going with this. Um, and well, the nice thing about schema.org is that it is extensible by nature. It's been designed this way. And as a matter of fact, uh, there is an extension of schema.org that we can benefit from, uh, which is called Bioschemas. So Bioschemas is a community initiative uh, with the goal of extending schema.org for the purpose of marking up life science resources on the web. Uh, so the main, main goal is to help search engines understand and index web pages that refer to some life science, life science entities, resources, uh, improve the discoverability and interoperability of the web pages, which is basically the, the, the goal of life science, but just in, in the context of, of, uh, of life sciences. So the approach uh, is basically to reuse as much as possible schema.org. Uh, the idea is to say whatever is in, in schema.org, we can try to reuse it uh, as long as it matches our needs in terms of describing things. Now, if it's not sufficient, we can extend schema.org by adding some types, properties, uh, and describing how to use these new terms to describe to, to uh, mark up life science resources. Uh, another important point is to keep it simple. That is, the point of bioschemas is not to come up with yet another rich domain ontology about uh, different areas in life sciences. It's the idea is, is to remain relatively uh, at a high level of abstraction, such that there's going to be consensus. So you, we will not get into deep details of describing uh, proteins, genes, and, uh, and taxonomic information, for instance, but we will remain at a level where we are pretty sure there is a consensus. 
Um, Bioschemas also provides guidelines as to how to mark up the resources more precisely. So it's just not just about types and properties, but it says, okay, that type, uh, an instance of that type should have at least that instance of property with that number of values or one or maybe several. Uh, it will say which properties are recommended or optional and so on. Um, and also it will try to link to existing vocabularies or ontologies when, when they exist and when they are relevant. Um, last thing maybe it's to remain flexible. That is the point is not to have a very strict specification that you have to follow or you're out. Uh, you're okay, we are on the web. So people do follow the rules or not. And if they do not follow the rules strictly, well, let's try to deal with the data anyway. That's the, the whole idea. Uh, and Bioschemas also has an activity to support software, software development, and I'll, I'll say a, a short word about that. Um, okay, so there are quite, quite a lot of terms that have been already uh, tackled in, in, uh, uh, in the context of Bioschemas. There are terms to denote proteins and genes, uh, data sets, or it's an enrichment of what already exists in, in schema.org in that case. Some more terms are uh, making their way through uh, the, the process like uh, biosample or computational workflow. Uh, and there exists a biodiversity group within the bioschemas community that has started by defining two terms that I will describe a bit more in details now, which are taxon and taxon name. So the first time, the first time that we have tried to, to work on is taxon. The idea is that taxonomies are the backbone of most biodiversity uh, databases and portals. So it's important to have a layer, a ground layer on which we can rely to denote taxonomy. Uh, so in that, in that page, the, the color code is uh, that, oh, sorry, I'm looking for my mouse. Yeah. Um, the, Dark red is, is uh, for terms that do exist in schema.org, properties or types, and green terms are those that have been added, proposed as an addition uh, by, by your schemas. Um, then you have information about the marginalities. That is in the first section here, you have the minimum information. That, that is, it says, uh, if you create, if you annotate a web page with a type taxon, at least you should provide a name and a taxonomic rank. Then you have recommended properties and optional properties. Um, now, if you look at the description of each of the terms, uh, you have the schema.org description that was here. In that case, name is the name of the item. That's the very general uh, description that comes from schema.org. But you also have a bioschemas description, which is some sort of specialization and says, okay, in the context of bioschemas and the taxon term, here is what the name will mean. And in our case, it says that name is going to be used to give the valid or accepted name of the taxon with authorship and data and, and uh, date uh, if known. So you see that this is uh, much more specific. Um, now, there is quite a, say, balance to find between, like I said, flexibility and constraint. And it's not always easy to find out the, the right balance. But in, in the case of the taxonomic rank, we have decided to add a property because we need at least to make sure we understand what's the property that's going to be used here to give the, the, the rank. Now, but the values of that rank, it could be a text, it could be URL or another type, which is a property value. The idea here is to be flexible. So people could say, this is a species. So they would give this, the string species, or they could give a URI from, ideally from a well-adopted vocabulary. So you could choose uh, URIs from the taxon rank, uh, Tadwig ontology or former uh, Tadwig ontology. Maybe you could use URIs from Wikidata and so on. So here we don't specify a list of terms that you should use, but we leave it open because the idea is that if we say you have to use this list that comes from that reference, well, most likely some people will like it and some won't. And if they don't, well, they, they will move to somewhere to something else. So that's the this this idea of finding the right balance. And arguably, this is not the best solution. I don't know. Um, okay, so let's see let's see an example. Um, if you're uh, assume you're marking up a web page that uh, denotes some information about the beluga. Uh, well, this is the 
most simple form of uh, JSON uh, script that you could add in your web page to mark up the page with the taxon type. So you say here you give the context. So you mean that the terms within this description will be resolved against that namespace. And you say that the, the page talks about taxon. It has a name, which is the full scientific name with authority and a taxonomic rank. And here I, I chose to use only a string as the taxonomic rank. Now it can be a bit more uh, specific and add more information. First thing, uh, this is a taxon, which is taxon in that case referring to schema or uh, namespace, but I could also use other, other types. Like here I can say, well, that's actually equivalent to the term taxon in the Darwin core definition. Uh, I could use additional values for the taxonomic rank. Uh, in that case, I, I give it as two values, a string and a URI from Wikidata. And that's the URI from the species taxonomic rank within Wikidata. Uh, the name is the same. I have alternate names, which are basically synonyms or unaccepted or unvalid names. Uh, vernacular names, here I use directly the property from Darwin Core because, well, we, we deemed, we assumed it was not necessary to create another property here. Uh, and I can denote the parent taxon here to say, uh, well, that th this taxon has a, the parent is the genus Delphinapterus. Okay. Okay. Now, what about links to other databases, other portals? Um, you have different ways of doing that. So the first one is to use the same as term, which is standard in schema.org. It links to web pages talking about the same thing. So here I just give the links to uh, the web pages of uh, Doris, Worms, and IUCN. Uh, I could be a bit more specific and give identifiers from remote databases. So in this case, I give an identifier here, which will be presumably my own internal identifier, but I can also give uh, the, I the equivalent ID in Worms. So here I just say, uh, here is a, an object that gives the property, uh, this property from Wikidata, which is Worms ID and the value here. So again, here I choose to use the Wikidata property. This is not mandatory. You do what you like. But the thing is that if you look at Wikidata, they already have properties for IDs of most well-known uh, biodiversity data sources. So why not reusing them? But again, this is not mandatory. Um, okay, so so far I've been talking about only taxa. Now, what about names? Uh, there are some databases and portals that are not registries of taxa, but taxonomic names like IPNI or Zoobank. Um, uh, so in the community in bioschemas, we had quite some debates about uh, whether we should make the scientific names more formal in the way we describe them in the, in the market data. Uh, and uh, we finally came up with this option of creating a second term, which is taxon name, uh, so that we can specifically annotate those websites like uh, IPNI, Zobank, or Microbank. Um, so taxon name is, is relatively simple. Basically, it has a name, an author, taxonomic rank, and this is basically it. You could add further information if you like, but you don't need more technically to, to denote it. And in the taxon specification, we have added a few properties, two properties. The first one is scientific name. So it is the equivalent of name instead that uh, in that case, the object is a taxon name and not just a string. And in the same way, we have alternate name for the synonyms. And we have another one, which is alternate scientific name, which is a list of taxon name instances. So uh, yeah, if, if you're interested in the whole discussion, it, it's been a bit verbose. So I pasted here the link to the GitHub issue where we discussed the need of, the, of that second term. Um, so here on the left, you, you have the, the script that could be added on the page that just mentions the, ta the uh, Delphinapterus Lucas name, that's it. And on the right, you have the, uh, the annotation, the markup of a web page that talks about the taxon and you want to link it with the name. So this is a type taxon and you give it a scientific name, which is an instance of taxon name. And then you can use, you, you can uh, give the uh, unaccepted names, which are instances of taxon name. Okay. Uh, so now you, you may wonder if, uh, okay, these terms are used at all yet or not. 
so the good news is that there, there have been some early deployments of, of those terms. Uh, the first one was uh, a work we have done uh, with uh, the National Museum, of, National Museum of Natural History in Paris. And uh, uh, so we have started to annotate their species page, uh, pages. Uh, so it, it amounts to something like 180,000 pages annotated with the terms taxon and taxon names. So basically these are web pages that existed in the first place, of course. And we just added some further information to embed within the pages a JSONL script that describes the content of the page using the taxon and taxon name terms. Um, so you could use the Google Structured Data Testing tool to check that. And if you give it the URL of that page, uh, you, you could see that uh, the, the testing tool, data testing tool will recognize different, uh, different types, the additional types, the name, which is the full uh, scientific name, alternate name, and if you get on uh, further, you will have the scientific name, alternate scientific names, and so on. Uh, okay, and uh, well, the good thing is that this is not the only one, and we have now uh, a few other early deployments of the terms. Uh, the last uh, chronologically, I think, is the GBIF. I, actually, I just came to know about this one uh, just maybe 10 days ago so, or so, and um, uh, it's just been advertised on the uh, Bioschema's website, where we try to keep track of the deployments. Uh, and the cool thing with GBIF is that, well, this is such a huge database that whenever they start doing that, well, it's immediately 3 million pages that are annotated with taxon and taxon name terms. So this is awesome, honestly, because it, it can be a real great incentive for the whole community to do the same thing. Uh, now, just, just to give a few other examples, Scolia is a website that uh, creates profiles for researchers and organizations journals, scholarly works uh, based on Wikidata. So it dynamically queries Wikidata to generate web pages. And uh, it actually uh, annotates the pages with the taxon term whenever they talk about some specific species or whatever taxon. Um, another very different example is PIPA, which is um, uh, the website of a plant phenotyping experimentation. Uh, uh, so the idea is that that website reports uh, experimentations that are done on the plant, phen plant phenotyping platform, uh, which basically uh, monitors the development of wheat plants, wheat, wheat crops. Uh, and they annotate the web pages with the taxon and biochem entity. Biochem entity actually represents the plant, the actual plant that is being monitored. Uh, and it is related to different instances of taxon to denote the species, infraspecies, varieties, and so on. Uh, and another one, another, uh, yeah, another one very different, which is uh, the, that last one, Opal Surf Casting. Uh, this is actually, uh, I think this is an association, I, I'm not even sure about that, that reports uh, legislation about, French legislation about leisure sea fishing. So it seems to be maintained by, uh, I don't know, uh, citizens. And the cool thing here is that just with these five examples, you can see that we have very different types of websites annotating their pages with the same taxon and taxon name terms. So you can start trying to cross those data just, just by scraping the information that's here. Um, so the first two ones are regular biodiversity sources. The next one is about scientific literature. And next one is more, uh, uh, it's, it's phenotyping platform. So it's more in the agronomy and agriculture domain. And the last one is totally different, you know, leisure sea fishing legislation. So it's, yeah, I find it say funny that you, you realize that, okay, just like that, you, you start having a way of crossing this information. That's the whole point of that. Okay, no, so now why do we do early deployments? Why, why does that matter? The thing is that uh, schema.org does not create new terms each and every day. Uh, you need to show good motivation for that. And one way to show the motivation is to have a community, a strong community that shows in its interest into using those new terms by deploying websites that mark up their web, their web pages with the new terms that you propose. 
Uh, and that's the only way for schema.org to accept new terms because they can see that, okay, there is some real potential in terms of gathering data and in terms of fostering novel applications because that's also the point. I mean, we are not just doing that for search engines. We are doing that for uh, fostering uh, the new ideas about how to make applications that would uh, exploit this information. Uh, and this is yeah, kind of the chicken and egg dilemma. I mean, if you want to have novel applications that will use that, that data, well, you need to publish the data in the first place, even though there is no application yet to, to uh, deal with it. Okay. Um, okay, so what are the next steps for the, the biodiversity activity within bioschemas? Uh, I just mentioned the two first terms terms that we, we have defined, taxon, taxon names. Uh, there are links in those definitions to Darwin card terms. Now, uh, that's just a start. We could, of course, think about many other works, uh, new terms, either new types to be added to schema.org or uh, new profiles to ex explain how to use schema.org to annotate other information. So. The information I can think of, but it's not limited. It's about specimen, for instance. So there are lots of works in uh, ABCD, open, dig, uh, open DS, open digitized specimen meets, which are which is a Tidwig community group. Uh, those people have pretty good ideas about what is the vocabulary that you need to describe specimen. So this could be a way to bring ideas in in the bioschemas community and say, hey. Here is how we could annotate web pages talking specifically about specimen. Uh, same thing about traits. There are some work on trait ontologies like uh, TPO, uh, trait plan ontology, about occurrences. You have uh, vocabularies like Darwin core occurrences that can be used. And again, th this is definitely not a closed list. So uh, I really encourage you to uh, to join join the group. And if you have ideas about and and uh, uh, ideas of what we could do with that, why we would uh, annotate bi biodiversity data of some type or another, well, just join the community and stop the discussion. Um, okay, so now ju just this, this is kind of a summary. Um, why, why are we doing this? Uh, so having one website marking up their web pages is basically useless. The, the interest comes when many people do the same. So if we talk about those terms, those biodiversity terms, uh, we now have GBIF annotated the web pages now. So now imagine other big integrative portals do the same, like Encyclopedia of Life and Catalog of Life, uh, collections, portals like iDigBio and Disco, um, but also in, in independent museum collections. There are thousands of museums that have their own website where they show their, their collections. Uh, think about literature websites like Biodiversity Heritage Library or, or PLASI. Um, there are lots of citizen science platforms and independent institutions, associations like the one I showed just before. Okay. All of these are potential candidates for doing that. And as soon as you have such critical mass of web pages annotated with the same terms, well, you start having a, a huge potential for developing new applications. <clears throat> And I, I talked maybe a lot about search engines here, but search engines are just one of the applications. Uh, you can think of developing registries that will uh, try to uh, make uh, some sort of cartography of the biodiversity web, aggregators that will scrap pages from lots of different uh, websites, totally different ones, and I don't know, create some repurposed data and and come up with clever ideas to, I don't know, to, to use the, this information and then come up with nice applications that do that. Think about all the gray literature. We, we mean gray lit literature, you know, these are all the reports and CSV files that are just stored on your laptop that, that you never publish anywhere. Well, that's a way of publishing that. I mean, you can, you can put this information on a website, make it downloadable and just annotate the page and say, okay, that thing talks about this taxon and this taxon and what else? And then maybe your information will become useful for somebody, you don't know. Um, okay, so a few takeaways. Uh, I think you, you've got my point now. Uh, marking up web pages is, is a way of increasing the visibility and discoverability of your web pages and overall of your data. 
it is relatively inexpensive. Um, most of the time, uh, when you have a website, yeah, you have a process that reads data from your database and generates an HTML page where it's it's not much work to uh, continue the process and just in in addition to the HTML code, you just add a piece of of uh, JSON script and with a few markup information. That that's yeah, pretty uh, pretty easy, and it's not going to be uh, costly, or it's not going to require much uh, computing power. Um, marking on web pages is is also that that's the idea I've tried to convey is a way to connect pieces of data that so far are not connected. So think about the gray literature. Now, it is of course not a magic ballot. Ballot. Um, there are lots of issues that will not be solved because you're marking up your data, your web pages. Uh, if you have discrepancies in the ways, in the way names are used, uh, people disagree about the names. Well, well, they, they still disagree whenever this is published on, on their web page using markup data. Um, if people sometimes don't respect, don't comply with the nomenclatural rules, well, same thing. You're going to have troubles aligning words, uh, scientific names that do not respect the same nomenclature rules. Okay, so again, this doesn't solve any of these issues, but these are long lasting issues. Um, I mentioned also the case of taxonomic ranks, but there are other issues like that. So for now, we have proposed that anybody could use any terms of their choice to denote taxonomic ranks, URIs, string, whatever. Uh, but that, that means also it's more difficult to cross the data, to make sure the data talks about the same thing. So again, there is work to do, but, but still, it, it is quite, um, uh, it, it can really spur new use cases and, and new applications. And maybe finally, just a word about the search engines again. Uh, so we, we often blame search engines because they are like pump up uh, our data and make money out of it. Uh, well, this is right somehow, uh, but at the same time, we can consider that we can benefit from that what they are doing. Search engines are good at doing one thing, scrape, well, crawl the web. And they are almost the only ones to be capable of doing that because they have huge infrastructures optimized to do that. So what, what if we can take advantage of that and make them do the job for, for us? That is, if they can scrape the web, the web and uh, have uh, leverage terms that are in schema.org that we could have in, endorsed by schema.org like taxon, taxon name, specimen, occurrences, traits, whatever, then we can use those certain genes as an entry point for some further data integration task. Uh, we can also think about specialized uh, search engines. So we now have the example of Google search engine, uh, sorry, Google data set search engine which can be a very good entry point to find data sets talking about some biodiversity domain. But in the end, we can think of new applications like a species search engine, which would be specifically focused on this kind of markup data and so on. So you see, the, I, I think the, the scope is pretty large about what we can do with that, but now it, it needs uh, the, that people, that the community adopts the practice uh, as a general, in a general manner. And uh, well, thank you for your attention. Um, and uh, I think we will have time to take a few questions. Thank you, Frank. Really, thank you very much for your interesting talk. So um, there are already a couple of questions in, in the Google Doc. Um, I don't know, maybe you can stop screen sharing yes, so that we can see each other a bit better. So for those who have questions, um, please feel free to, to raise your virtual hand or put um, your questions in the Google Doc. But I'm happy that if you would, if you want to frame your question by yourself, I think this usually makes more sense if um, you are here. So the first question was, is there any plan to adapt GBIF and catalog of live websites with microdata? But um, you already showed some examples. Um, so the for, second... for GBIF, this is done. For uh, Catalog of Life, I don't know. If, if there are some people here from, from Catalog of Life, maybe they could answer. Can I turn the mics on now? No, I see. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. 
So this uh, remains, uh, should be answered afterwards. Is there a document documenting the mapping with Darwin Core? Um, so the mapping with Darwin Core, yeah, it, it's, it's on the, the specification of the taxon type and taxon name types. Uh, for now, well, the, the only reuse that we have made of Darwin Core is, is the vernacular name, I think, yes. Uh, which, which doesn't mean you cannot use other properties. I mean, when you're marking up your data, your pages, you should try to comply with the rules that are provided in the specification of the terms, but you are, that, that remains the semantic web, it's open. So you can still add some further annotation using Darwin Core or even other, other vocabulary that, that you like. Uh, now, I'm not sure I'm answering correctly the answer, uh, the, the question. If the, the question is more about, is there a way to translate uh, bio schemas markup into Darwin Core? Uh, no, we have not done that yet. Uh, but to be honest, this, this is no big deal. Like I said, bio schemas tries to remain a pretty high level. So it doesn't get into much detail. So basically the taxon type will be the equivalent of the taxon term in Darwin Core. Uh, well, there's not going to be any equivalent, I think, of taxon name. There would be an equivalent in the Tadwig ontologies that had a concept for taxon name. OK, thank you. Um, well, the, the question was rather short, so I don't know whether this was answered by your answer now. Um, the, the next comment is by Steve, but this is rather long. I don't know, Steve, maybe you would like to write this by your own? I, you sort of already answered it, so I don't know if you want to spend time on it. I guess I just, I have experimented with this sort of thing in the past and nobody ever seems to make use of it. But I guess part of your point is just that you, you need to have fairly wide adoption before people will take the time to develop the scraping tools and things like that. I mean, Google basically has never paid any attention to anything that I've ever done, but maybe Google is the wrong audience. Yeah, but by the way, uh, Bioschemas uh, tries to support the development of some tools and in particular, uh, tools that would help you mark up your pages, that is, so that you don't have to write the JSON code by hand. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, tools that help you scrape the data from web pages. So there is at least one of them I can remember, which is BeamUse. Uh, you, you will find the, the link on the, on the Bioschemas uh, website. Uh, it, it, is, it makes the rendering of a, of a web page and just extracts the information and, and translate this into uh, entriples file. And you can that, do that with uh, thousands of URLs that you give in a list or, or just a, a sitemap. So yeah, there, there are things that, that can help you to do that. Maybe Alice there is, is online. Maybe you have uh, other pointers to tools that can be used to do that, Alice there. Um, I've just put a pointer to Bemuse in the chat here. Um, yeah, so I mean, really, the key here is about sort of coming up with the innovative apps that are going to use the data that's available. Uh, so we've got a fairly robust scraper there now that can do page directed scraping. Um, and we just need people to sort of think, right, I've got this data over here, this data over there. I want it to be constantly For updated. People will really make new applications exploiting it. Yeah. Oh, more than Sorry, willing yeah. to help people do that. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, is by Debbie, but her connection is right in stable. I don't know whether you want to speak up. Otherwise, I will simply read the question. It's uh, Frank, can we already share people information if we have PIDs for them? I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, I'll try, Frank. I'm, all I'm saying yeah. is you were talking about different properties, taxon, taxon name, um, other people. If we're starting to gather and, and mo there's momentum around identifiers, Wikidata, Q numbers, or uh, ORCID IDs for people. Can mm -hmm. we, if we have that data, mark it up in a bio schema? Is yes. It yeah, absolutely. One, one thing that I have 
not shown in, in the examples is, is that you can add an ID for any kind of thing that you mark up in, in, in your piece of JSON LD, and it's actually recommended to do that so that we are sure not to create blank notes all the time. Uh, so you could use IDs for your taxa, for people like an orca, orc ID is pretty good. So yes, definitely. Thank you. Um, the next comment or question was by Anton van der Put. I don't know whether I spelled it in the correct way. Uh, you would like to speak up? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Anton van der Putte. Uh, I manage the SCAR Antarctic Biodiversity Portal, which is a node for GBP and OBIS. And so in the polar community, the general data community, we have been discussing a lot the use of schema.org to make metadata uh, better discoverable. Uh, and I think within the ocean best practices communities, there have been discussions about using that as well and, and the semantics behind that. Uh, have you been in touch with them uh, discussing these things? Because I think it's, it's good that there's these initiatives, but I also think it's good to talk because uh, it's good if they can convert at some point. Um, and then maybe it's good to talk sooner than, than later. No, it is an initiative. I, I don't know. I've, I've not been in touch with those people. Um, but yeah, like, like I said, the, the community is very open. So if you, if you guys want to join uh, the biodiversity group within Bioschemas, it's, and if you want to propose, propose just, just start discussions, actually. Yeah, but yeah, Let's it might be good goes. to invite you to, to one of the, the, the polar group. It might be good that you give a presentation there as well, because it might give a a different perspective for, for, for us uh, mm -hmm. group as well. Sure. But thank you. Very interesting presentation. You're welcome. Um, the, um, Frank, can you put a note somewhere where uh, people can contact you or your group? I don't know, in, in the chat maybe or in, in the Google Doc later on so that, um, that they don't have to dig for your email address or any card tech data, that would be great. Yeah, just pasting my email address here. Um, then there's a question, uh, is it very, it is very common, um, it is very common people share data using data repositories like Fiction, and Riot. They already use schema.org to annotate data sets. But is there any way to use bioschemas within repos? So maybe also sharing a JSON file? So I don't know those those repositories, Fiction and Riot. Um, so the I just re double read the, they already use schema.org to annotate data sets. Is there any way for to use by schemas within repositories? Um, so I'm, I'm not sure how to understand the question, but the, the, the thing is you could, you can use multiple annotations at the time. That is, you could uh, annotate a page saying, this is a data set. So you, you use the regular term schema.org slash data set and say that data set is about that type of entity, which is an instance of that and that and that. So here you can connect that to bioschemas terms. Uh, I, I'm not sure if that answers the question, honestly, uh, about sharing a JSON file. Uh, well, that can be done. Uh, this is this is a possibility that you have, uh, you could, you could put in your sitemap, for instance, a direct link to markup file, so a JSON file. That works, although this is not, I've, I've, as far as I have seen, this is not so much recommended as good practices. Um, at least when, when you talk to Google, they say that they prefer when the data, the markup data is embedded within the page so that they can really connect things together. Uh, but again, that's, what Google says. <laughs> Thanks. Um, then there's a, just a comment, but I will read it out here as well. Um, we are using bioschemas in our work in the Disco Synthesis Plus specimen data refinery for describing and registering the workflows and for describing the digital specimen. I think that's that's a good way to go here. Then there's a question by Frank Teten. Is it possible to mix JSON LD and microdata in the same document? And further on, JSON LD is relevant for indexing disco 
interoperability, while microdata can help to parse documents coming from HTML websites. Okay, so technically, yes, it's always possible to mix different formats to annotate your web page. You can use microdata, RDFA, JSON-LD, all in the same page. And that's often what happens, by the way, because, uh, well, anyway. Um, now, is it a good practice? Uh, I'm not so sure. Uh, again, the trend seems to be to uh, try as much as possible to split things. That is to avoid uh, mixing marked up markup information within the HTML code. That's what's going to happen with uh, RDFA, for instance. Um, but yeah, again, this, this is just a recommendation. Also, yeah, um, Bioschemas recommends JSON-LD. That's a recommendation, or I would say a strong recommendation. But technically, again, this is this is not mandatory. The, the thing is, I don't know what happens if you mix formats. What do search engines do with that? Can can they connect connect things if you talk about the same in, the same uh, terms but in different formats? Maybe they can. I don't know. Thanks. Um, there's a question by Zach Maritim. I don't know. You would like to phrase your question by yourself? Okay, maybe not. So, how how's this will um, how will this optimize spatial search, for example, for occurrence or geographic scope? Uh, I will not try to fool you. I don't know. <laughs> this is definitely not my domain. I'm I'm not an expert of special special data. So yeah, honestly, I, I don't have the answer. Sorry about that. <laughs> so there was a comment by Matt Yoda. I don't know whether this answers the question. Geo JSON hooks. Uh, yeah, Geo's JSON is a JSON format. It's not JSON LD, but maybe you can mix it with with some some JSON LD. I'm not sure. But again, yeah, I'm I'm not the the right person to answer this question. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. You cannot answer everything. <laughs> um, I can then see the there's next one. Yeah. How difficult or easy is it um, to add the JSON LD into WordPress and Blogger? Yeah, that, that's a question uh, we had uh, at the Chadwick conference. So um, basically, whether this is bioschemas or schema.org or anything else, uh, that doesn't make a big difference. Uh, so when it comes to uh, content management systems like WordPress, Drupal, usually you have plugins that help you mark up the web pages. So they are pre-wired with forms that will help you fill in traditional information like organization, people, uh, maybe the products that you sell, if it is a, you know, a search uh, SEO plugin like search engine optimization. Um, now, these plugins usually give you the ability to add other types of uh, markup information beyond those that are pre-wired. And you can use anything within schema.org or bioschema. So um, my answer is that there is no specific plugin so far to help you put bioschema's annotation within a WordPress page. But you could use regular plugins to do that, though, even though it's going to be a bit more manual, probably. Uh, in the future, I think having maybe the deployment, the development of a specific plugin for WordPress or Drupal would be probably very good to help people do that and avoid technicalities for sure. Okay, for the next comment, I think we will simply uh, collect some some links and background information for newcomers to this topic and share this um, after after the session. Um, there are already some answers from, from the question from Stan, which is, are there other examples of standard organization interacting or influencing schema.org or bioschemas? Um, and how should Tedwick interact with schema.org? Well, Maybe standard you can organizations, some... yeah, I, I don't know what it means really. So if, if this is about well, like organizations like I don't know, Tedwick or GBF, I, I don't know if there are direct links. I'm not sure, honestly. Uh, but 
bioschemas is a relay. So there are in bioschemas, there are people from, uh, I guess, GB from Tadwig. So it is a relay and that's the right interface to talk with schema other people. That's what happens usually. But there might be other direct uh, exchanges between those that I'm not aware of. Okay. By the way, to just uh, just as an information, uh, there, there there has been something that was available on Google when when you Google the name of a species, uh, you may have a rich snippet that links to Encyclopedia of Life, and for some time it was giving directly the traits of that species, and I have always wondered how that that was possible, how how that did happen. So, I suspect that at some point there were there were some contact between Google directly or schema.org and uh, Encyclopedia of Life, although I, I didn't have a confirmation of that. But yeah, maybe that was a one-shot try to experiment this kind of thing. OK, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, it's also already 6 o'clock, at least in Germany. I think it's you have other times on your, on your clock, on your computer. So um, our webinar is over to today. Um, thank you very much, uh, Frank, for your talk, um, for answering thank all you. those thank different questions. Uh, we will, of course, make those information available afterwards. And the session uh, was recorded or is still recorded. And we will also make this available and announce this on the TEDWIC website. So thank you all um, for joining the session today. And um, there will be more webinars coming. So stay tuned. Thank you.